Right. Good afternoon. Uh, for those who are here in person, thank you for joining us in person. I would encourage people to try to move into the center so we can make it a more consolidated conversation when we get to that part. Thank you everyone for joining us for a discussion and a book launch focused on Professor Christoph Jaffalo's latest book, Modi's India, Hindu Nationalism and the Rise of Ethnic Democracy. Now you will hear more about his impressive biography and his accomplishments from Professor La Ruelle. But let me just note a couple things that I hope will set the stage for today's discussion. Professor Jaffalo is a scholar of immense productivity. He's published in both French and English and with South Asia, his region of focus. He has studied this region with particular attention to India and to Pakistan for some three decades and his work has enlightened us on democracy and its fault lines in South Asia. He has written extensively about caste and democracy in India, including the rise of subordinate caste political parties, about Hindu nationalism in India, including its philosophy and its political rise, and about nationalism and conflict in Pakistan as well. Every student of contemporary South Asia, including me, relies on and refers to his scholarship. Professor Jaffo has done much throughout his scholarly career to situate contemporary developments in India and South Asia as part of and relevant to our global understandings. He served as the director of Science Po's Center for International Studies, a multidisciplinary institution with strong area studies, as well as strong international, uh, international affairs emphasis, very much like the Elliott School. With his new book, he offers a look at the evolution of Hindu nationalism in India's electoral democracy at a time in which several international metrics of democracy, such as Freedom House's Freedom in the World Report and the varieties of democracy project, have noted alarm about the direction the country is heading. Earlier this year, Freedom House lowered India to the partly free category, noting, and now I'm quoting from the report, India's status declined from free to partly free due to a multi-year pattern in which the Hindu nationalist government and its allies have presided over rising violence and discriminatory policies affecting the Muslim population and pursued a crackdown on expressions of dissent by the media, academics, civil society groups, and protesters. The Varieties of Democracy Project, or VDEM, stated this year that India had moved from being a democracy to an electoral autocracy. We encourage all participants joining today to consult these two publications for more details. The direction of India's democracy, the world's largest democracy, matters enormously. India's sheer size, its long-standing free and fair elections, and its commitment to the freedoms provided for by its constitution have been a reason India has been an important part of the global democratic order and an inspiration to many around the world even if, like in the United States, the practice of those freedoms at times falls short of the constitutional ideals. So this is not an esoteric case or something on the margins, but rather a consequential country with implications for the health of democracy globally. That is why we should listen carefully to the discussion today about the evolution of India's democracy and about the place of minorities within it. This is a country that matters for our own global future and certainly to our understanding of democracy. So with that, let me turn things back to Professor La Ruelle, who will formally introduce our speakers for today's conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dinaire, for your uh, introductory remark. This event is organized by the Institute for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies, and in particular, our uh, Illiberalism Study Program. And we are co-sponsoring the event with our colleagues from the Siegel Center for Asian Studies. As it was just said, Christophe is a very prolific author. He works at the Center for International Research Sciences Po, but he also serves as its, as its director from 2000 to 2008. He's currently a senior research fellow at CNRS and a professor at Sciences Po in Paris. But he is also professor of Indian politics and sociology at the India Institute at King's College London. And he has taught in the US at Columbia, Yale, Johns Hopkins, also in Canada at the University of Montreal, and he is a global scholar at Princeton University. Since 2008, he has been a non-resident fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And so not only Christoph has been working on India and South Asia, but he has also been a great uh, theoretician of nationalism and populism. And very recently, 
He launched an observatory of populism in Paris with whom our illiberal, uh, illiberalism studies center is, is cooperating. So you see a lot of uh, overlaps between uh, what we are doing here at the school and globally the, the French academic uh, uh, landscapes. Our discussion today is Deepa Olapali, who is a political scientist specializing in Indian foreign policy, India-China relation, and India regional security. She is a research professor of international affairs and the associate director of the Sigur Center. She also directs the Rising Power Initiative, a major research program that tracks and analyzes foreign policy debates in aspiring power of Asia and Eurasia. So I really look forward to our discussion. I will now give the floor to Christophe for a short presentation of the main kind of key elements of the book. And then I will give the floor to Deepa for some comments. And then we will have time for a, a Q&A session. So Christophe, welcome. And I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marlene, for the invitation. And thank you, Alisa, for this generous introduction and the, the very right words you add with a sense of gravitas with the, the way the uh, democracy is evolving in India. I will not speak more than 10 minutes uh, just to highlight the main points, uh, the main arguments I've made in this book. Uh, I would prefer to have a, a longer, I do prefer to have a, a longer Q&A session and, and, and Deepa, of course, uh, has read the book and, and will um, comments and will comment upon it. There are three parts in this book, and uh, they have keywords uh, summarizing each of them. Uh, national populism for the first one, ethnic democracy for the second one, and electoral authoritarianism for the third one. So that helps me, in fact, to summarize the main arguments. An argument, uh, the main argument that, that is, uh, of course, covering post-2014 India, but that arcs back somewhat uh, before. And, and uh, the, the, the period that is covered in this book, uh, in fact, is, is 20 years because uh, the Gujarat moment of Narendra Modi is, is covered in the first chapter. And I think it's very important for me. Uh, and you will see why in a minute. But it begins also before 2014 because one of the hypotheses of this book is that the rise of Narendra Modi uh, is largely a response to the post mandal uh, scenario that evolved in the 1990s and 2000s in India. And that is a keyword for signaling the rise of low caste in, uh, on the in domestic scene. I do think that's my hypothesis and I'll return to it in a minute that uh, the antidote to caste politics had to be uh, something like Hindu nationalist slash populism, national populism. That's the first part of the book. Uh, Modi is embodying this new political style as early as the Gujarat years is clearly a pure product of Hindu nationalism and the fact that it presided over the 2002 pogrom in Gujarat is one of the uh, pieces of evidence uh, you can mobilize for making that point. Polarization, polarization along religious lines where clearly was clearly a strategy uh, that uh, he implemented in the vein of predecessors, because we had seen riots before, but of a smaller scale. But what is important to add is that he brought something new that none of his predecessors had brought to politics. It's Hindu nationalism plus populism. And populism is, of course, a style of politics that can be codified, that has been uh, codified by uh, the way it relied on, I would say, a few criteria. One, the populist leader claims that he represents the people against the establishment, against the elite. And Modi was very good at doing that. First of all, because he was in a position to say, 
I am at the periphery. I'm in Gujarat against the center. And at the center at that time, you had, of course, Manwan Singh, the prime minister, but also the Nehru Gandhi dynasty, quote unquote, and could say, I am a son of the soil against cosmopolitan, Tsunya Gandhi being of Italian origin, uh, leaders and protectors of the Muslims. And he called Delhi the Delhi Sultanate to make this point even more explicitly. Two, he was able to project himself as a plebeian vis-a-vis -vis aristocrats, vis-a-vis -vis the liberals, the English speaking uh, liberals and, and, and elite people uh, of Delhi, um, represented again by the uh, Nehru uh, Gandhi family. So this idea that he is from a low background, from a plebeian background, someone from the people, uh, was an important factor of his um, credibility as someone of the people. He was from a, he is from a, a low caste uh, background, uh, another backward class uh, caste, and he used to be, uh, as he said, a chaivala, uh, someone who was selling tea on the platform of the station of his little town. All this is, of course, part of a kind of um, legend, if you want, but it gave credibility to the populist of it all. Never before at BJP, his party, someone of that kind at his death. It was an upper caste party. It was a Brahminical party, even if you can. If you, it was a Banya Brahmin party made of um, upper caste uh, traders uh, and, and, and Brahmins. At least that was the image. And indeed, it was why BJP could never win more than 20% of the votes. So the plus vote, the plus vote that Narendra Modi brought was, was largely due to this uh, populist um, style. And the third criterion of this populist style that needs to be mentioned is the way he relates to the people. You know, populists are charismatic people, always charismatic leaders. They know how to speak to the people. And he is really a great orator in his own style. Charisma is uh, partly encapsulated in this capacity to speak and to relate to others by using social media massively and in a very pioneering way. He did it as early as the 2000s when nobody was, nobody was using social media, nobody was using mobile phones or holograms the way he did. He was innovative, always ahead of others in terms of communication with the help of PR companies, including APCO Worldwide, that is based in this very city. And that's another story, but we can return to this if you want. This, and that's the fourth and last criterion of um, the way I would define um, Modidva. Modidva is Hindutva plus populism, if you want. The business model. All this is very expensive. Holograms, for instance, are very costly. You can saturate the public sphere the way it did as early as 2007 for the 2007 elections in, in Gujarat, because you mobilize huge resources. And this is the um, way, this is why chronic capitalism is absolutely part of this style of politics. You need support from people with deep pockets. And, uh, as early as the 2000s, especially in the context of the vibrant Gujarat uh, annual meeting that initiated for businessmen, he related to businessmen who will gradually became so close that they could fend uh, his, his campaigns. These are the four criteria of populism, but as you understand, national populism is the right one because it brings together Hindu nationalism and populism, national populism, because the people he represents is not made of everyone. It's made of the majority of the sons of the soil of the Hindu majority. That's why you can also call it majoritarianism. You know, Hindu nationalist uh, populist style of populism is uh, of course uh, equally well described as majoritarianism. It worked very well as the 2014 elections showed. And when they won, when BGB for the first time won full majority in 2014, it was 
the time of some elite revenge. And we, we saw the podcast coming back in a big way in parliament, in the government. The government of Modi in 2014 is more a podcast than any other government after Mandela. They had succeeded in using uh, this style of politics for bringing back the old elite, which was on the defensive since Mandal, since the rise of, of low caste politics. That's the first part of the book. I'll be more, much, much quicker on the, on the two others. Um, the second part of the book is, of course, about what did they do? What did they do when they uh, seized power? And they established a kind of ethnic democracy. This is a, a, a concept that comes from uh, Israel. Samir Smoha was the one who introduced this idea of ethnic democracy, a democracy where you have elections, where you have a relatively independent judiciary, where you have some free press, but a democracy where some citizens are more equal than others, where you have second class citizens. And in Israel, they are de jure second class citizens because the Arabs do not have the same rights as the Jewish people because it's a Jewish state. Well, India is not a Hindu state, but it's a de facto ethnic democracy. De facto because you have, and I study these groups in detail in the book, vigilantes, which are making sure that everybody knows uh, its place when it doesn't belong to the majority, mostly mostly Muslims, but also Christians, which are targeted uh, repeatedly by uh, vigilante groups in the framework of, of campaigns, campaigns against conversions, campaigns against uh, uh, inter-religious marriages, what they call anti-love jihad. Uh, campaigns. Love jihad is, 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 is the word they use for denouncing interreligious marriages between uh, Hindus and Muslims. Um, campaigns against cow uh, slaughter, cow protection campaigns. Uh, one after the other, since 2014, we've seen, we've seen these kind of movements. And, and on the top of it, land, uh, anti-land jihad uh, activities, you know, something uh, that is more sophisticated to make sure that there is no mixed neighborhood anymore, to make sure that uh, Muslims will not stay in Hindu majority neighborhoods. So ghettoization is the result of this process and it works because of violence mostly. I focus in the book on one group of the Sangpa River, the uh, Hindu nationalist uh, Nebula uh, Bajandal to document this vigilantes activities. And uh, I prepare to return to this in the conversation if you want, but uh, it's a very important dimension that affects minorities, that affects also liberals. You know, liberals from NGOs, from universities, from the media, who have been trolled, who have been intimidated, who have been uh, clearly um, badly affected by, by what has happened since uh, 2014. Um, just one example, uh, there were 30,000 NGOs in India in 2014, uh, 10,000 are left. And one of the reasons is that you can't get money from a board. FCRA, the license giving you access to uh, money uh, is not there anymore, which has resulted in the um, dis disappearance uh, of huge NGOs, you know, one of them was an American NGO known as Compassion. Compassion was in India since 1968, and it was educating something like 140,000 students. They have closed down in spite of protests from the uh, American ambassador in uh, India a um, few years ago. So that's ethnic democracy, I think, easy to understand, and those who uh, uh, visit India uh, have experienced uh, this transformation of uh, the social uh, context and political context. Third, and that's more about the post-19, the post-2019 uh, elections, electoral uh, authoritarianism. Another concept that comes from um, another uh, theoretician, <laughs> Andreas Schedler, has coined that formula. You can also say competitive authoritarianism. 
What does it mean? It means that there are elections. And uh, the ruler is not winning for sure. There is some competition. There is some pluralism. But the checks and balances are not there anymore, not to the extent they were before. No, democracy is, is based on elections and the rule of law. And you can't minimize one of the two without affecting the whole system. In the case of India, of course, the demotic dimension, the electoral dimension is absolutely necessary. That is what gives the leader its legitimacy. And this legitimacy helps him to minimize, downplay the power centers that are the judiciary, that are the election commission. The judiciary has been described by the uh, law minister, um, the then law minister Arun Jetli, as the uh, unelected tyrann. Yes, of course. Lawyers don't have the legitimacy of the people the, the, who have been elected, but they are key to the uh, democratic uh, system. So they've been affected by the way the um, rulers have imposed their will, but others have been equally affected. And I list and I study in the book the Central Information Commission, the Central Bureau of Investigation, the National Investigation Commission, the Election Commission, all these institutions have been undermined one way or the other. Either because you leave, you keep the post vacant, and if there is nobody to do the job, the job is not done for sure. For instance, the uh, Central Information Commission, that was the one in charge of the Right to Information Act, a major piece of legislation for Indian democracy that had been uh, introduced uh, by the previous government, and that is now very much diluted and probably um, uh, not easy to, to relaunch. Um, either you uh, appoint friends at the end of these uh, institutions. And, and I have a long chapter on how the Central Bureau of Investigation has been captured uh, by, by, by friends of, of the uh, rulers um, coming from Gujarat. What I also try to show in this last part, and I will end on this, is the fact that elections are not a level playing field anymore for at least two reasons. One is money. The electoral bonds, which have been introduced, allow the um, parties not to disclose who gave money to the uh, candidates. And uh, the most reliable estimates assess that BGP has spent $3.6 billion during the 2019 elections, which is more than all the opposition parties together. So elections are not a level playing field anymore because of this kind of situation, but also because of the media coverage. And uh, the rise of new TV channels, including Republic TV, that has been started by a man who is now a minister of the Modi, in the Modi government, by the way. Um, also, the, the, the fact that uh, so many uh, journalists um, uh, have been um, trolled and intimidated, and sometimes more, uh, IT rates, income tax rates, for instance, uh, do the job uh, in some cases. The media coverage, plus this uh, financing uh, of uh, campaigns uh, indeed made elections uh, much less fair than they used to be. I will end there by uh, saying that the point of no return might not have been reached. And um, there is definitely a form of resilience of democracy in society. And uh, the coming um, 
weeks and months will show whether this resilience can be effective again. We'll have, and I'll end on this, by the end of the month, probably a very important bill introduced in the parliament, the privacy bill, personal data are at stake there. Whether India is still in a position to pass a law that is compatible with the way in the West, in Japan, in South Korea, privacy is respected or not, will be a very important indication of whether this is more or less a surveillance state or whether this kind of rights, fundamental rights, is still uh, preserved. The judiciary is somewhat recovering from what it did over the last few years. And in relation to this surveillance question, the way the Pegasus case will be uh, investigated will also be another very important indication. So I, I leave you on, on these uh, somewhat perspectives uh, and, and we may return to them uh, in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Can I invite you maybe to sit here and we will now give the floor to Deepa. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, Christophe, even though it's only on Zoom. Congratulations on your book. The story of Mr. Modi's rise and his impact on India's political and social life is of course a familiar one by now, which has been told and retold many times. But I found that your story is bigger and bolder than anything I've seen so far. Dean Ayers has already set the stage on why India's democratic fortunes are so important for all of us. And there is so much that we could talk about because your book covers so much in so much detail um, that in fact, there was, I have to admit that at times I felt I was missing the uh, forest for the trees. So um, it's hard to quibble with the details that you have laid out in the three uh, sections that you just talked about there is a richness that is astounding in terms of the research detail that you've gone to collect. So uh, what I thought I would do in the few minutes that I have, I want to step back a little and raise three broad issues. Um, and some of these are questions, uh, partly theoretical, but also uh, going to some things that I saw were uh, a, a, a sort of a gap. So let me start with my first point. Now, I find that there's an implicit inevitability thesis in your book. The narrative you give is pretty much unidirectional with the BJP having become kind of an unstoppable force right across India's political, social, and moral spectrum and universe. Um, in my reading, you trace this link back to the early 20th century Hindu revivalism, uh, even though you focus on the last uh, 20 years or so. But I wonder whether you're imputing more continuity. And again, what I saw as inevitability to this than perhaps is warranted. Because one question is, why didn't the hard Hindutva or ethnic democracy take hold earlier? Why did it remain on the periphery and was never able to acquire an important political shape? In the end, when you distill all your evidence, I see that your answer really comes down to a single individual in the form of Narendra Modi, and in particular, the new populism that you just talked about, that he brought to Indian politics. Now, in that case, you're in some sense reducing what I thought you saw as a historic force to a more of a great man version of history, a great leader version of history. So in a way you have sometimes two somewhat contradictory explanations going on. One that is deeply sociological and the other that is almost accidental by way of the individual leader. Now, of course the implication of one or the other is very different in terms of future outcomes. 
And I think it would be good to get a clearer analytical demarcation about the relative importance of these two uh, somewhat uh, competing, if not contradictory uh, 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 arguments. Um, the second point is that I want to make is that um, you've given extremely short shrift to two regions of India which have not come under the so-called Modi magic. That is the South and the East. You mention it, but you really don't examine it very closely at all. Hindu na Hindutva nationalism has not been able to make the gains in the South and East, like in the Hindi heartland. I think this needs more discussion and explanation. Um, I might also point out that a survey by the US Pew Research Center this year on religious pluralism in India overall found some surprising results showing that there is still much greater religious tolerance among the Indian populace at large than you would get if you focus your analysis on BJP leadership alone. So I think there's again, a certain disconnect that uh, needs uh, to, to, to be bridged as well. Now, also looking ahead, and if you look at this situation with a political party lens, and in this case, a regional political party lens, um, could it be argued that ultimately the BJP is like almost every other Indian political party, which is based on regional or other multiplicities of identities? You mentioned that the BJP's vote share went from 20% and up, but it still was held at 31% of the vote in 2014, and it went up to 37.5% in 2019. In a different type of electoral system, the political dispensation would have looked very different. So one could make the argument that the BJP's natural constituency is confined to what we used to call the Bimaru states or the Hindi heartland, and that it could revert to that status at some point. Uh, and in, a, in a sense that what we're seeing now is an aberration of sorts and not the historical norm. So I think the regional local political dynamics remains an interesting puzzle. And the recent by-election suggests that politics in India at the local and even state levels remain competitive, fragmented, and dare I say democratic at that level. And so again, there's somewhat of a, a disjuncture here. My third, uh, well, so in the sense, what I said, I'm suggesting is that your analysis remains somewhat incomplete, which is a hard thing for me to say about a 500 page book, that there's anything that you have, any stone you've left unturned, but uh, I, I did want to raise these two points. My third and last point is what I personally find to be the single most disturbing specific development that you talk about. And that is the rise of vigilantism, which you also uh, raised at the end. Uh, you've given several examples of mob violence. Um, and the one issue I want to raise is the role of social media in rumor mongering, fake news, and hate speech leading up to and surrounding these episodes of vigilantism which is a frightening um, for across the board, uh, not just uh, minorities, but for the population at large, if this gets really becomes a more of a norm and it spreads. You do lightly touch on the role of Facebook and WhatsApp, but my question is whether these social media giants are now not just enablers, but actually accessories to these crimes. Now we're finally getting some of the inside accounts of what goes in uh, Facebook and so forth by whistleblowers and investigative journalists on just how pernicious these companies are with their algorithms and that seek to actively promote inflammatory hate speech to drive up social media uh, user accounts. India seems to be especially vulnerable given the increasingly polarized and communal environment to begin with. 
And let me just quote from last week's Washington Post headline. Uh, it says, quote, how Facebook neglected the rest of the world fueling hate speech and violence in India. According to the Washington Post, which gained exclusive access to a trove of internal Facebook documents, these documents show Facebook simply didn't invest in key safety protocols in the company's largest market in the world, which is India. Obviously, Facebook didn't create the conditions for vigilantism in India. But there is a new internal external linkage that we don't fully understand. Is the promotion of hate speech, the facilitation of armies of online trolling, the instantaneous mushrooming of fake news to millions of users and so on, has it become more of a driver or causal factor of recent vigilantism than we think? This means that we may have to rethink whether vigilantism in India is only an expression or outcome of on the ground communalism or in this digital tech era, it is something more and different. I think the results are frightening enough either way to not give social media an easy pass on this um, deadly issue. And I, I um, thank you for uh, raising some of these issues. And as I said, I simply did not want to wade into the enormous detail that you've given in the book for the three um, main points that you made earlier. So I will leave that to some of the audience questions perhaps, but uh, thank you for that uh, bold and new treatment of what's going on in India. Thank you so much Deepa for these wonderful uh, comments. Before opening the floor for question, I would like to offer the floor back to Christophe for continuing the discussion and replying to some of Deepa's comments. Yes, thank you so much, Deepa. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Great. No, thanks a lot, because you've raised questions which are of a prime importance. I will not uh, try to do justice to all of them, but uh, I will, I will uh, pick and choose. Uh, and to begin with, this very important question of uh, the inevitability. Uh, was it something that was bound to happen? Well, what I try to show in the book is that uh, there were structural conditions which probably suggested sometime that if Modi had not existed, it would have had to be invented. Uh, there, there was a need for uh, someone of that kind, I think from two points of view. One, I insist on the context of the post-Mumbai attack by Islamist scene. Uh, the, the, the years, the 2000s, uh, are the decade, 2010, it is a decade of Islamist attacks in India, which have helped the Indian nationalist to mobilize, to polarize. Uh, and I think it's uh, something they have exploited very well. And secondly, there is this societal dimension that I mentioned um, by passing. post mandal India is, a, is an India where low caste people have improved, have asserted themselves in the context of an economic growth that helped a lot. And then by 2013, the economy reached plateau and these people who have emancipated themselves and who have expectations are frustrated and therefore they will find a new Mesha in Modi who in 2014 will promise jobs the Gujarat model you know that is something that was a very good selling point so on the one hand you had the upper caste people who felt under threat and who found in BJP forever a kind of protector and on the other hand you have new emerging groups, which found in Modi, not in BJP, but in Modi, someone who could deliver for them. So these are societal, social, uh, I would say dynamics, dynamics uh, which explain that it goes beyond the man. It's also the circumstances, I mean, 
but you can say structural circumstances, which will which will help him to 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 rise. Um, and third, but not but last but not least, and that that helped, helped me to respond to your last question quickly. This is a very well organized movement. You know, I think the RSS uh, the, the, the last sentence of my first book in in 1996 said yes bjp is only uh, supported by a fraction of the electorate but it is only the top of the iceberg and there is a huge organization a student union a labor union a peasant union you know, so many other uh, organizations uh, and, and they are of course very much active in the us too it's across the globe really there are no equivalent in the whole world an organization that is 100 years old and that has grown constantly penetrating so many different media and using the most sophisticated techniques of communication including social media and that's take me back to your last question so that's another massive factor and uh, it's, it's always forgotten because it's below the sea level. Quickly, the two other points you, you, you made. Uh, yes, the South and the East are still not conquered. Uh, the Northeast, Assam, is now very much part of the BGP strongholds. Now, uh, can they return to a North Indian only party. That's something to, that remains to be seen really. Karnataka, for instance, is a Southern country where BJP is now very well entrenched. It's not a Northern party only. And even West Bengal, you know, in West Bengal, they had just zero seat five years ago. All of a sudden they become the number two party. So, it's a, it's, it's a very, um, but I agree to the other side of this same question. Yes, state politics remains different, you know, and, and, and there is a kind of dichotomy you now. There is a differentiation between the national scene with Narendra Modi winning elections for the BJP and the state scenarios in each state, yes, there is more competition. And therefore you have an amazing dichotomy and differentiation and, and disconnect between the electoral results at the national election time and what's going on at the state level. Uh, making, of course, the party uh, vulnerable because it's like a pyramid on its head. The question for BJP leaders today is after Modi Wu, the same question we had in the 60s after Nehru Wu, because to replace someone who is winning elections for the party by an equally popular leader will be quite a task. And, and the party is allowed from inside. You know, there is no state party leaders. They are all parachuted from the center. So the, there, is, there is a kind of irony that Congress party people remember very well. Indira Gandhi somewhat killed the party by doing the same thing, appointing leaders at the state level from above. And none of them had any base. So the moment she disappeared, it was uh, quite complicated. So I will not um, disagree with you on this very important point. There is, there is a, a, a very different state politics and, and the book is not entering into it. That will be another one. Thank you so much, Christophe. We, we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So do we have question in the room? Alisa, please. Mike is coming to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe, for this. I, I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more in detail about the, the difference between the Modi government beginning in 2014 versus 2019. Uh, the 2014 campaign was a campaign about jobs and economic growth and development for all 
It was a, a, a political climate in which Mr. Modi, as a candidate, uh, was very quick to uh, correct uh, more sort of uh, Hindu nationalist comments from people like Praveen Doradia. Um, 2019 looks very different. For me, the kind of bookends are thinking about uh, development for all as one slogan. And then after the Delhi riots, the idea of shoot the traitors. Those are so diametrically opposed to each other. I almost can't believe they're coming from members of the same party. How does 2014 turn to 2019 in your account? Well, that's a very, very um, good question. Um, I would say in 2014, people who supported Narendra Modi pretended that they did it for development, but knew perfectly well that he had been the 2002 uh, emperor of the Hindu art. That was the name he gave again after the, after the program. So certainly the Gujarat model attracted uh, additional voters. But I think there is no doubt that uh, they knew that he would deliver on the um, communal uh, card, I mean, uh, in this domain. Now, 2019 is interesting because he replaces development by security. And that's how the plus vote will be, I would say, kept kept and, and, and probably increased because they, they, they move on from 31% to 37%. Security on what ground? Pulwama. And uh, we had never seen an election campaign, maybe 71, maybe the post 71 Bangladesh war, the, the, the 72 state elections have been won by Indira Gandhi on a similar kind of aggressive militaristic uh, slogan hiring. But uh, I had never seen this, uh, and I'm covering elections since 89. Uh, I've been there for each and every uh, election since 89. That time, you add military officers on uh, the bills. And uh, it was not only that India had been attacked, but had attacked Pakistan, you know, Balakot, and, and so on. It was, of course, one of the reasons why the mandate was not for development, but for security. And it's important, if you win elections when you do not deliver on the economic front, why should you focus on the economy? And since 2019, India is even less interested in having a consistent economic policy because that's not how you win elections. And that's something Narendra Modi learned in 2004, when Vajpayee, in spite of shining India, in spite of economic growth, lost to, 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 U, to UPA, to Manmohan Singh and, and, and Congress. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why you have this uh, intensification of the communal agenda and the Ayodhya Mandir temple, plus the uh, CA plus the abolition of Article 370. You know, after 2019, you have three or four major reforms, which were not on the agenda in 2014. I mean, not that high on the agenda. So that's why I, I, I said in my presentation that there is indeed a post-2019, um, I would say, profile of, of, of Modiba. Now we may see a new change, but, but I don't want to be too long. But there may be a new change. The, the, the reshuffle of the government that we saw two months ago or six weeks ago is very interesting. You see for the first time, low caste ministers uh, appointed in such a large number that for the first time under Modi, you have almost as many OBCs, Dalits, STs as upper caste. Caste politics is very much back on the BGP side, which, is, which was not at all the kind of strategy they were following till then. And it's true also of UP, Uttar Pradesh, where there are elections in February, elections they should not lose because this is a key state. And again, the government of, of, of Uttar Pradesh 
has been plebeianized in a very new way. Is it a new phase? Is it a new car? They keep changing track for keeping uh, somewhat uh, people um, behind them. Let's see. It's uh, it's it's really to say. Yeah. There was a question here. Sir. Um, Professor Jaffo, thank you. Uh, this is a really like you know, fascinating conversation. Um, so I'm a senior here in the Elliott School. My name is Pranay. And for my senior thesis, I'm research. It's a comparative study of the shared ideological themes and contemporary legacies between Hindutva and revisionist Zionism in India and Israel, respectively. Um, and one of the sort of themes that I've seen popping up is, especially reading um, Savarkar and Golilkar's work writing, is this idea of sort of racial regeneration and national renewal. I think. Goldwalker wrote, like, you know, the lion is not dead, he's only sleeping, um, and that the Hindu nation will rise again. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to, to what extent does this politics of racial and national regeneration play out in the contemporary politics of um, the nationalist right in India as represented by Modi and the BJP? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I, they'll, I, I deal with this, but briefly in the first chapter. Indeed, there is a fascinating parallel between Hindutva and Zionism in, in, in two dimensions, at least. One, Hindus are not believers, but a people for Hindu nationalists. They are not defined by, by their creed, but by the fact that they are the descendants of the Vedic fathers. And that's something Savarkar says in 1923 in their vein runs the blood of the Vedic fathers. So, blood is the common feature. And it, he, he uses, he uses a, a, a word uh, that is jati to define these people. And sometimes he say race and jati slash race. So Hindus are a race. That's one common feature. The other one is the idea of the secret territory, the secretness of the territory. You know? India is a punya bumi, the secret land with its rivers, with its secret cities. You know, it's, a, it's very similar to the way Zionists will look at Israel as, as the promised land. As, and, and of course, the original land as well, of course. Now, there is a third factor that needs to be taken into account. They also feel vulnerable. Vulnerable vis-a-vis the Muslims surrounding the country. Of course, it seems ridiculous to think that 1.3 billion people can be so vulnerable vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and so on. But that's the core, I think, uh, the root cause for the rise of Hindutva, feeling of vulnerability. Hindus are vulnerable because they are divided into so many sects, so many castes. And they have also got this idea that they are an effete race vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims. That's the stereotype of the British that has been uh, internalized. So this is also something you can compare with Israel. You know, Israel being vulnerable for the same reason or similar reasons. And that's one of the reasons why you see uh, security, militarization. You know, you have to be prepared. You have to defend yourself. And to import uh, some sophisticated weapons from Israel is part of this history. It's a very, very good comparison that needs to be uh, elaborated upon. Yeah. We have another question in the room. If not, we have several questions in the chat. We won't have time to go over, but I just would like to maybe conclude with this key question on what is happening now and related to COVID and the, the, the COVID crisis. So, how do you think Modi's COVID policies? Is affecting are affecting his credibility and legitimacy among moderate Hindus, and how would you put that kind of sanitary crisis in this kind of global context of national populism, ethnic democracy, and kind of electoral authoritarianism? No, it's it's a very good question because this, that was a, a very big test. You know, the second wave uh, in April May was such. Uh, Terrible time, not only for uh, for Indians, you know, the usual casualties, uh, 
migrant workers who had to go back to the village, like in the first, like during the first wave almost. But also middle class people, middle class people who who could not find a bed in hospitals and, and oxygen in the first place. Yeah. Now this wave that has probably resulted in uh, many more uh, death than officially. Officially, India has something like 400,000 uh, casualties. Every demograph, people, who, who, demographers who has done the job say 10 times more. You know, in, India has a record number of probably 4 million people who died. And yet, and yet, the government gets away with it. And, and this is very interesting to imagine, to, 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 to see how you can be above accountability. Because of charisma, you know, charisma again is something Max Weber defined not as the quality of a virtuous man, but as the quality of an exceptional and exceptional people are above accountability. And, and, and Modi is exceptional in many ways because of the pogrom, because of demonetization, because of Balakot, because of Article 370. He has done things nobody had dared to do before. And that's exactly what Indira Gandhi had with her. You know, she did things, uh, nuclear test, uh, Bangladesh war, uh, Sikkim annexation, things, emergency. And she could be re-elected after the emergency precisely because she was a Bogota. So we have a repertoire of politics that is very far from the usual criteria we apply. We expect a ruler to deliver. And we give him a mandate, and he's supposed to deliver, and we re-elect him when he does things he has promised he would do. That's completely different. You don't vote for a man, you vote for a superhuman leader. And you're happy he deserves your vote. You know? there, there is a very interesting relationship that is, I think, something you can compare to the Guru Shisha Parampara, you know, the, the guru disciple relationship. And, and we have just finished with one of my. Um, colleagues, uh, not Donna Natalie, a study of uh, Man Kibat. That is the monthly radio program Modi is organizing. Every month he speaks to the people on radio. What does he say? <laughs> Political scientists don't care. They usually don't go that far in analysis. Well, big mistake. Because when you listen to what he says, and we have millions of words in, on our data sets, he speaks like a guru. He tells people what they have to do in life. He is their conscience. He is their mentor. He is their father or brother or anything. And he keeps calling them brothers and sisters, always. Or Mitron, my friends. A personal relationship, a very affectionate, compassionate. That's what they remember. He is there as a reference point. A man like that cannot be wrong. So you change the ministers and you get away with it. So minister of health, minister, so many ministers have gone and the COVID fiasco has been on them, never on him. That's why you can have elected prime ministers for life. Huh? Of course, China has a different model, but India is inventing a prime minister for life kind of system, which needs to be understood. And that's why we need to do psychology as much as sociology, as much as political science uh, for understanding the uh, illiberal era. Well, thank you so much, Christophe. I think on you know, that it would be a, an excellent way to conclude. We are getting short on time for the other question. There was, as you can imagine, Christophe, a lot of question on how Modi's India and this rise of ethnic democracy is affecting or is influenced by foreign policy in the regional context. We won't have time to go 
on that, I think it was really excellent to really look kind of in depth on the domestic scene and not only on the, the, the regional uh, geopolitical aspect. I would like to thank all our people here in the room, all those who are with us uh, online and on Facebook, and thank Deepa for our great comment. Dean Earth, thank you so much for your introdu introduction. And Christoph, congratulations again for that book that really is showing us how much India matters when we are looking at this kind of global trend of national populism. I think it's a key, key country that we should be putting in the picture more often than being only kind of Western centric and looking at Mr. Putin and Mr. Orban <laughs> or Mr. Trump, but, but really have India in our picture. So once again, thank you so much and congratulations for the book. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>